Hello and welcome to Public Conscience, the anti-corruption program produced by the Progressive Impact Organization for Community Development, Primog. I am Adao Biobi Abumur with Esther Basi. Thanks for joining us. The spelling of Primog is P-R-I-M-O-R-G. On Public Conscience, we seek to evolve a corruption-free society by drawing government and citizens' attention to corruption reports and issues for prompt democratic actions against them. We also promote integrity by amplifying rare cases of the display of honesty by public and private individuals. We appreciate the MacArthur Foundation for supporting the production of this program. About three months ago, a United Nations Children's Fund report said the number of -of out-of-school children in Nigeria had increased to 18.3 million. This alarming figure unfortunately positions Nigeria as the country with the highest number of -of out-of-school children globally. Our focus on today's program is on the persistent increase in the number of -of out-of-school children occasioned by insecurity, poor education system, poverty, corruption, and other issues in Nigeria. Two recent investigative reports published by Premium Times exposed how poverty, shambolic education system, tortures, teaching, and learning environment continue to worsen the out-of-school children problem in Niger and Nasrua states. According to the reports, besides insecurity in Niger state communities, most of the classrooms are dilapidated and unconducive for learning. While in Nasarawa State, three, there exists a litany of rots in the rural public schools in Karo, Nasarawa, Kokona, Wamba, and total local government areas. The problems include dilapidated structures with leaky classrooms, insufficient classrooms and teachers, lack of access to water, open defecation due to the unavailability of toilets, and insufficient or outright lack of furniture, the report says. The report also states that 42% of female children in Niger State are out of primary school compared to 39% of their male counterparts. According to a 2023 survey on the rate of out of school children in states, Niger State is the ninth worst state and Nasarawa occupies 14th position. Imo is the state with the lowest number of out of school children in Nigeria. Waikabi is the state with the highest number of primary and secondary school students not in school. Today's program will once again draw the attention of the Nigerian government to the continuous collapse of public schools and how it is driving up the number of -of out-of-school children. For you out there, how worried are you about the growing number of -of out-of-school children in Nigeria? And as a nation, where do we start in restoring the poor state of education system in primary and secondary schools? How can the government address the rising number of -of out-of-school children and the falling educational system in public schools? Be ready to join us through phone and text messages during this conversation. The WhatsApp phone line to send your message is 0902-265-6167. That is 0902-265-6167. Please indicate your name and your location when sending this message. This number is for messages only. Please begin to send your messages as soon as possible to 902 Two six five six one six seven. That is zero nine zero two two six five six one six seven. We will give out the numbers to call shortly. If you just joined us, the focus is on two recent investigative reports published by the Premium Times, exposing how shambolic primary and secondary school system in Niger and Nasarawa states continue to boom the number of out of school children. But joining us in the studio to expand on this conversation. Are the Chief Executive Officer, Gender Consult, Joyce Amadu. You're welcome. Thank you. We also have an investigative journalist, Kafilat Taiwo. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. We will also be joined via the phone by a board member of the Civil Society Action Coalition on Education for All, Abdullahi Saleh. But let's start with um, Kafilat, who did this investigation. Could you give us an overview of your report? Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Kafsat Tyro. So I did an investigation on the number of -of out-of-school children in Niger State. So from data, I'm a data journalist. I work with DataFight. So we make use of data for whatever findings we are looking forward to. So from the data, I got to know that, okay, Niger State is the 10th state with the 
highest number of out of school children in Nigeria. So going further, there is a need for me to delve into this to find other reasons. Probably there are some things attached to why we are having like growing number of out of school children in the state. So when I got there, I got to know that in the number of out of school children, we have more female children that are out of school compared to their female to their male counterparts. So going there, I got to know that the state education, the state sector, the education sector in the state has a lot of challenge faced, that is facing it at the moment. Talking about poverty, hunger, lack of staff, and other issues are factors like failing these um, out of school children. For instance, the schools I visited I got to know that these schools lack basic amenities such as um, toilets. Even these schools are not secured. You can, for instance, there was a time when I went to a school, I got to know that the school was not fenced. The school is easily accessible. Anybody can just walk in. How many schools did you visit? I, I visited like more than seven schools. Were they all on fence, not fence? Um, the school I went to about let's say out of let me give an instance let's out of ten, the schools that were fenced, they are not up to four. Mm-hmm. Others were not fenced, so what? I just entered. There was no security, nobody to question me. That mom, what are you looking for? So I saw children roaming about, walking around during the school hour. When I asked, when I asked what they um the what they were doing, why they, they were, were going, outside. Why they were outside. They said they were going to school. Some said they were returning home as at 9 a.m. in the morning. So when I went to the um, the head teacher's office, when I asked, so most of them, they narrated their experience that this is what they've been going through. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't have enough staff. Since they even, they, I went to a particular school, so the head teacher made me understand that since the government stopped the feeding program, children have stopped they've stopped coming to school. Is, is it only the feeding program that is the result why we have so many out-of-school children? Or no, are there no. other factors responsible? No, there are other factors. For instance, when I moved to the classrooms to check the state of these classrooms, that, okay, let's see what is happening, I got to see that most of these children were seated on the floor. There were no chairs, there were no tables. Do you have an idea of how many pupils were in a particular classroom? For a particular, uh, this particular school I went to, at least there were like, there were more than 40 in the class. There were more than 40. They were seated on the floor. If you read the story, you see the picture. They were seated. They were sitting on their school standards. And not all of them have school standards. So those that have school standards will remove their school standards. They'll sit on it, on their school standards. Even I noticed that maybe they have like few chairs. In some classes, they had few chairs. So about a single chair that is meant for a single pupil, about five of them are struggling to sit on that particular chair, just mm. to avoid sitting on the floor. Okay. Even uh, the ceilings, the ceilings are already down. We will get back to you, Kafila, but let's speak with Joyce Amadu. How would you react to this? Thank you very much. Well. The the challenges are well are clearly explained in the in the study, mm-hmm. and of course even just like she rightly said that the girls are more likely not to be in school than boys, and with all the challenges she pointed out, you know that is just widening the gap for the girl child, because even the report said boys are more likely to be in school than girls. So what are the, those challenges for the girls? There are challenges at the home front. We all know that the girl child is the one that takes supports the mother in, in care responsibilities. You know, and a lot of parents, particularly in the northern part of Nigeria, do not really see the importance of girl child education. So it is just widening the gap with all the challenges she the report pointed out. Uh, dilapidated building, no chairs to sit, um, uh, the, the, the stopping of the uh, of the feeding program, you know. So it's just widening the gap. If a girl child have a challenge or if the parents do not really see the need or the importance of enrolling that girl child in school. So it's only worsening it because the school has nothing to offer in terms of learning environment. The learning environment is not friendly. 
you know, for the girl child to go and learn. You, you rightly said no toilets, no no security. And of course, parents will not be will not be comfortable to allow their girl child because you know the girl child is more likely to be harmed, is more likely to be abused. So if we do not have securities in the schools, then what 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 you can imagine the danger for the girl child. So it's just widening the gap. Just widening the gap. The challenges she faces in the home front and then coming to school again. Just like I read the story that of course even the, the, the caregivers or the parents do not even see the need. They went to the school and they said ah, this is the condition of the school. So they, they cannot allow their girl child. You know, they cannot allow their girl child to be coming to school in that kind of condition. You come to school, you sit on the floor, you know, the floor is dirty, the ceiling is almost falling. All these are half health implications. So no responsible parent will, will want to see their children. You know, so it only makes it uh, uh, makes it possible for girls not to keep coming to school. All right, thank you for your perspective. But yes. let's speak with Abdullah Hisale, who is the board, who is a board member, of civil society, action coalition, and education for all. You're welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, let's have you react to the two investigative reports before us talking about the shambolic education system in Nasarawa and Niger State. Okay. Yes, I I went through the report. Uh, it's something that I I think that I relate with because I have gone uh, I, I think across the country uh, to monitor the state of uh, infrastructure. Uh, and uh, what I saw actually speaks uh, speaks um, volumes, you know, on how our government values education. Yes, Nepal State is not um, different from other states where you realize that the state of infrastructure is such that uh, even animals cannot who don't want to stay in them. Uh, it will shock you that even here in the FCT it seems to be worse. Here in the FCT, so I, 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 I do understand what states are going through in the FCT itself uh, the seat of power does not have adequate infrastructure for learning. Uh, I think that governments have not paid adequate attention to education in the sense that beyond what UBEC, what they get from UBEC for matching grants, gover governors do not add do not add anything to the education budget. I did see what Lesrawa budgeted for education, but then when you look at it, when you dissect it, you understand that there are high institutions, there are other transitions of the Ministry of Education that are benefiting from that 40 billion they're talking about for that year. So it might not totally go into uh, basic education, because I think what we're talking about here is basic education as primary and your secondary. And so you, you realize that beyond what they get, the, the matching grants, what they contribute to what you think is giving, they do not uh, give uh, any other funding towards our education. Yes, the government partners they do are, are, are intervening in some states. I know Agile is in six states, Bethesda is in some some of the states. You know, to also complement what government is doing. But um, yes, the story is the same in the entire country, and it's, 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 it's unfortunate for the younger generation who will certainly ask questions in the near future as to how our parents have taken education when they were in power. Thank you. Okay, so if we look at the reports from UBEC talking about uh, matching grants, there are so many states who have not assessed um, the UBEC's uh, matching grant. And if you also, I wouldn't, I'm sure you read the report from WAEC talking about the number of, the rate at which students failed WAEC this year. Do you think that there is a nexus between funding and poor um, health education outcome? Yeah, certainly there is a correlation between funding and, uh, and outcome. In the sense that um, if children miss school, then they would not be up to date with regards to the curriculum. And we know that Nigeria has been facing one strike or the other, even after going through COVID, that kept many children out of school because of the cruelness of government, where they do not have other options. We also are faced with insecurity. Once there is an attack, children don't go to school. Once teachers are not their welfare is not taking care of, which you know has been the norm in the country. That teachers' welfare has not been prioritized. Children are home 
once the education, once the learning environment is not conducive, certainly you lose time. Take for instance, a child can should be able to spend uh, eight hours, um, sorry, seven hours or so in school, but because of the debt in infrastructure, it's being uh, reduced so that they can accommodate two streets. That also affects the, uh, the, 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 the time, you know, for learning. So the failure in YX is not surprising because um, of these factors, but most especially, I think, importantly, I think we do not prioritize teacher training and uh, welfare of teachers. So our teachers are lagging behind in terms of uh, catching up with um, with what's happening globally. YX is a regional exam. It's not peculiar, it's not just a uh, set in Nigeria. So other countries that are prioritizing education will not wait for us. They will not say, oh, because Nigeria has been on strike, we are going to change this and this. No, no, no. So I, I, I do believe strongly that um, this has affected uh, the learning outcome. Come to, talking about uh, the matching grant, I had an in, engagement with UBEC lately. I sat on the same table with the executive uh, secretary of UBEC and um, when they presented their report, I realized that only two states have not accessed their matching their matching grant. Only two states. I think Ogun State and one other state uh, have not accessed. So governors are accessing. Because they kept saying that governors are not accessing. So we were looking at how to engage with governors. But then when they presented their report. When was this asked, when was uh, this engagement with UBEC? Pardon? When was this engagement your engagement with UBEC? It was last Last month. July, July. We had okay. two engagements with them in July. Because as of July, they said that over 27 states were yet to access the UBEC fund. Okay, you see, this is how it works. Uh, this year, they're accessing 2023. Now, the 2023, I yet I know, has not been accessed fully. I also uh, went to my state to talk to my governor about it. And uh, this year, they're accessing last year's fund of 1.3 billion. And uh, yet, as of July, I, I, I do understand that about half of the states have not accessed. Uh, in my state, they said they were still working on the work plan. So I do not know exactly what they are up to, uh, but it shows you how uh, UBEC funding or education is not so much a priority to many governors. Even though the UBEC executive secretary did decry the fact that some UBEC chairman said they do not have access to their governors, I, I got me worried. That how can I be ahead of an important institution like UBEC, like SUBEC in my state, and cannot access my governor for discussions? Or my commission of education, if it's that important, you know, to get the governor. Because you must pay your matching grant. It is not just you go, you go collect your, you know, whatever money you have. No, no. You must show commitment with regard to paying your own matching grant. Okay. So, yeah, uh, 2024, uh, sorry, 2023 is not fully accessed. Uh, 2024 is not fully accessed. Okay, but are you also aware that the matching grant has been increased to 3.5 billion naira? Do you think that would end in any way assist the states? Yes, uh, our engagement partly with UBEC was to see how we could advocate for an increase in the matching grant. I said, I said, I said the team of two spicy coalitions were about 10 uh, from Sachefa and uh, other platforms of our uh, education uh, stakeholders that engaged with them. And what they asked us is to see how we can help use our platform to lobby for an increase, which we agreed to. My fear is this, that even the 1.3 that they were, that was available in the past, many states cannot, cannot pay that 1.3. Let me talk about states in the middle belt, in the uh, regions where uh, they do not have other sources of income, like, um, like rivers that have, you know, and other, the oil producers. Uh, I think I can talk of more than five ministries that get less than half a billion as their annual budget. And then here you are asking the governor to cover 1.3 billion in counterfeit uh, uh, you know, for just primary education. So many states governors don't see that as a priority. What is governors that feel education is uh, something they need to attend to, uh, mm. see that as, a, as something they should invest in. So the 3.3, I'm really afraid. I'm very much afraid uh, as to how many states uh, will be able to 
also match that 3.3 uh, 3.5. Yes, I'm excited that it has been increased because the truth is that we have monitored educa- um, infrastructure across the country this year. You then gave us the, the job to monitor infrastructure across the country. And what I saw, what we saw on the ground is really, really worrisome. Mm. That we need a humongous amount of funds and political will to work on infrastructure in the country. All right. The same point is still a five guy, but I am sure it's better than nothing. All right, thank you so much. The will prioritize uh, matching those funds and uh, doing the needful, you know, Okay, in one minute or 30 seconds because of our time, what would be your advice to both the state governors and the federal government? Well, we, we just have to prioritize education. We need to understand that the issues in the country today is not all connected to the lack of education of our, of our, of our young people. Uh, I, in one of my visits two years ago to, to UBEC, the UBEC Institute Secretary warned that 20 years back, there was a study that this this happening that we see in the north was going to happen because education has been neglected. If government had acted just the way good luck started with the Almaty schools and other initiatives, then we would have made this in the board. Governments, those in power, must realize that the issues in the in the country today, lack of development and, and, and all what not, is, is connected to education, and so they must do the need. All right. Thank you. thank you so much for your contribution at this time. Abdullah Hissali, thank you so much. We sincerely appreciate you. Board member, You're Civil welcome. Society Action Coalition and Education for All. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Um, Joyce Amadu, while Abdullah Hissali was speaking, you kept on nodding mm. like you agree with all that he said in terms of um, state governors not being able to match the grant counterpart fund by the federal government in order to improve mm-hmm. the infrastructure and other um, amenities and facilities needed in our school. How would you react to all of this? Well, that's just the fact. That's just the fact because we will not be where we are today if the governors prioritize education. Because the truth of the matter is that we are talking of infrastructure. Children don't, don't come to school. When they come to school, they don't have a, 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 a good learning environment. You go to the, the buildings, I mean, seeing the kind of buildings, like when I saw the report, I saw one of the buildings and I'm like, is this a refuse dump or is this where you are expecting children to, to, to learn? So as it is, the children just come to school just for, for say, maybe they leave home, okay, we're coming to school, and at the end, the children don't even end up not learning anything. Because how, how can you learn when you don't even have a chair to sit, you don't have a table, you don't have writing materials, you sit on your slippers, there's no security, there's no toilet... These children just come to school just to fulfill our righteousness. Let's just go to school. And you go back without learning anything. And of course, we know that the primary and secondary school education is a bedrock, is a foundation. If children don't get it right at the primary level and at the secondary level, then we are, then we are, we are, we are, we are doomed. You know, so the, the seriousness, the, gov- the governors need to take this seriously. They need to prioritize education. Because if parents do not prioritize, that government has a role, a huge role to ensure that even parents prioritize. But of course, they cannot, they cannot put parents, uh, they cannot hold parents accountable because they have not even uh, provided the right infrastructure for children to come and learn. So how will you compel parents to come? Because even if I'm the one I go there and I say, so, no, I cannot allow my child to learn in that kind of school, or my ward or anybody close to me. So government has a lot to do on its own part. Government needs to show that, yes, it is taking the lead with regards to education, and everybody will follow suit. Government needs to show through its funding. Okay, this is what we have available for education. This is what we have for teachers training. This is what we have for infrastructure. This is what we have. This is what we have for, for quality of education. This is what we have for uh, stationaries and for facilities. Government needs to clear, uh, state that clearly. You know, because you cannot have, you cannot, you have grants lying out there, and you are not going to 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 to, to, uh, to assess it. Then you, it's not that the money is not even there; the money is there. Okay, we'll you know, so back. obviously they've not prioritized it, and they they just like it was just one of those things. Unfortunately, Kafila, you. you talked mm-hmm. about you talked about access. You just walked in yeah. and you went straight to the um, principal's office yeah, without anyone. Office without anyone stopping you. Yeah. Tell us how this is affecting the, the, the people's security, how this is, you know, swelling insecurity and out-of-school children. Okay, considering the fact that um, there is um, an issue of insecurity in the country. So, and I noticed that 
um, in most schools in Niger State, mm. they have their primary schools and um, junior secondary schools in the same compound. Yes, they have them together there. So going to the head teacher's place, it was so like it was an easy one for me. There was no protocol that you have to see someone or you have to go to someone. So when I got there, and she was able to like, she was able to provide answers to my questions. And what I noticed is the fact that these teachers, like, they've been complaining. You know when you've been complaining for a while and there are no solutions, so you just have to give up. They've, they've been complaining, they've written to the um, the state government, nothing has been done. So they just, there's nothing they can do to these children. There's not. It's just like a case of you wanting them to come to school, and they came to school at their unconvenient time, and you end up sending them back home. They will go back to their houses. They will not even bother to come. So they just have to be like they have to work with the children to just to like um, advise and employ them to always come to school. Okay. So when, for instance, when I asked this first school I visited, the school is around the Madala. When I asked for the like punctuality rate of the pupils in the in the school. So the teacher, as I've said earlier, the teacher said when the feeding program was on, uh, most of them came to school, but now they've actually reduced and there's nothing they can do. Here. So I feel we need, the state government need to come and uh, like the state government need to address this, um, um, like this, the fact that the children or the school environment like is open they need to do something because um when i Kapila, ask for let me hold you up there we have a call hello. hello hello yes good morning your name and where you're calling us from good morning my name is john and i'm calling from uh season two in Abuja. john let's hear you how would you react to the conversation um like um in my own village where i came from i'm from ben ben Okay, the, what is the situation like that? The government school in my own community is something else. Like, even the teachers, even if you school, you can't even find any teacher in the school. During the school day, the teachers will go to the farm. Even if the children are there, nobody to teach them. So at the end, everybody felt like, okay, well, there is no teacher to teach my children. And there is no any standard there. Uh, a private school, even for you to take your child to. So the learning process here yeah, is very difficult. In short, this time I travel home and I saw the way the children are without going to school. They are all at home running around because there is no any, any school close by for them to go. So the government has to really do more effort and do something about it. So which, that's my which school is this, John? Which school? You said okay, it's a government uh, school, from, which... It's, it's a government school, LGEA primary school in Ogenio Pico, in, in the local government of the school. All right, thank you so much for your contribution, John. Thank you. A school where the children are willing to go to school, but the teachers are not there. The teachers are in the farm. Could it be that they are not well paid, like you saw in Niger states where... The school teachers are not are not well funded, and like our earlier guest talked about, poor welfare for teachers. Okay, so the um the state government needs to like make things work for the teacher by making sure that they employ more ends for them because looking at situation of things where we have like over forty pupils in the classroom. And when I interviewed one of the teachers, so she said ideally there were supposed to be two teachers per class, but due to the fact that they don't have enough ends, so they just have to just short to between classes. And in some schools, they those teachers had to like from their pockets, like they needed to employ SSC orders just to fill up those gaps. When I asked her, how much do you pay these people? They said they pay them between 10K to 15K, and they have to come to work every By 10K, day. 10K, you mean 10,000? 10, 10,000 Naira. Between 10,000 to 15,000 Naira. That's the amount they earn monthly. And I asked them, how do you get this money? He said, um, they do communicate with the PTA members, like, okay, 
just contribute little amounts they can afford just to like make this work within the school vicinity so these people pay money so from the little contribution they make so they pay these ssc orders and i have that are you sure with the amount you are paying them have they been delivering well like have they been teaching have they been meeting up with standard they said there's nothing they can do it's better than the old gap like there should be nobody to fill in those gaps okay so, i feel like Sorry for jumping in there. Do we, uh, did you at any point contact appropriate government, you know, agencies, governments, um, governments that are in charge of um, this secondary school education within Is this state? Is school? I mean, the primary school education within this state. Yes, I did. I reached out to the um, the, minister, the uh, commissioner, the state commissioner of education, when I reached out to her. She didn't give a response. Did you, did you reach out to her via call? You went to her office? I reached out to her. I reached out to her via call. I reached okay. out to her. What was so, her response? The response she gave was that she has nothing to say for now. That's what she said. That was after I spoke with the NUT chairman of the state because the man really lamented. He gave me, like, you know, it is a different case when teachers say this is what is happening, stuff like that. And you have a... Uh, like an higher authority to confirm that this is actually what you are facing in the state. So I did that to confirm that. Uh, Commissioner Mao, they said this is what has been happening. Can you just confirm? She said she has nothing to say. So and she was not aware or she just didn't want to? She doesn't want to speak to it. Unfortunately, but just to quickly add that, we also reached out to the Ministry of Education to also have them speak to some of these issues what the ministry is doing to address the number of out of school children but unfortunately the response we got is that the minister is the, the schedule is tight so let's get to joyce today we are looking at out of school children what will be the fate of these children in the next 10 15 20 years thank you well if we don't act now if the government don't act now, it will just, it will just keep getting worse. Because in education, you have to consider every aspect of education, both the demand side of education and both the supply side. When you're talking of the demand side of education is how do we encourage children to enroll from the home front? Because, of course, there are a lot of demand issues from the home, particularly, of course, for the gacha, like I mentioned um, earlier, that, of course, the parents are more likely to prioritize the education of a boy than that of a girl. That's why even in the study, the study even stated that uh, about 42% uh, of uh, primary school age children where the females are out of school compared to 39% of their male counterparts. Mm -hmm. So we think there's a lot that, we need, that needs to be done at the home for to encourage parents, engage PTA, engage caregivers to bring their words to school and ensure that um, they get the, uh, the appropriate learning. But also, if that, is, if that is done and also the supply side is not um, adequately catered for, in terms of uh, security, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in terms of uh, um, in terms of school learning materials, you know, in terms of toilets, all these things need to be in place. Everything needs to be in place. That one aspect of education should be prioritized over the other. For for us to make progress, for us to avoid, I mean, for us to uh, to have a future when we look at ten years to come and we can smile, we we have to start now. We have to start from today, and that's that starts from the government of the day prioritizing education. It starts from um, the funding, the budgeting. From the budget, of course, like I know in uh, what, there's what we call gender responsive budgeting. If you want to improve the life of girls or the women, it starts from your budget. That's when you we know that, yes, you make time. provision. That's when we know, yes, you are serious. It's not rhetoric. You know, you don't have budget, you don't have provision for it. There's no need talking about it. We're we are just rhetoric, we're just wasting our time. You know, so it starts from the provision. Right from the budget level, what are, what are we budgeting for, so, 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 and so. There's no budget, there's nothing anybody can do. Well, it's a good so, thing so government has a lot to do in this regard, in, and it starts from the budget, the, the, the funding. If you prioritize education, it shows us from your budget. It shows us from your budget that, yes, you are taking this serious. Whereas there's no budget, then there's nothing anybody can do. We'll just continue to, 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 to go around the circles, and we'll continue to find ourselves where we have been. Well, it's a good thing that you brought in budgeting and funding. Yeah. Um, of education system in Nigeria. So how much do you think um, the role of corruption or how much is corruption 
playing in the poor state of education in Nigeria and the growing you know, number of out-of-school children across the country. It's not just in the northern mm. side of the country. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Yes, oh, so it's, it's one thing to budget for education and it's another thing is for those resources to be allocated to what it was budgeted for. So these are, these, so these are two things. You know, there may be funding, there may not be funding, there may be funding. But even sometimes when there is funding to fund what particular aspect of education and then the resources are not, are not uh, deployed to you. So yes, corruption is another serious issue again. That if not tackled, then of course the gains that we are making in education in terms of budgeting, then of course will not take us anywhere. So it's very, very important that government of the day, when they allocate resources, they have to ensure that this resources that is allocated to any aspect of education is being implemented and is being monitored. If you implement, you don't monitor, then how do you know that the resources you allocated were well deployed and used? You know, So it's not enough to budget. Yes, we budget and then we implement. But even implementing, aspect of implementation, how have we monitored the implementation? Did every aspect that of education that was budgeted for, was it implemented? So we monitor and then we know that, yes, the money deployed or money budgeted was used. If that is not done, then we're we are not making any, any progress. We're not making any headway to ensure that we finance and then we ensure that um, those, uh, those things that, we, that were financed were, were well budgeted for. So, of course, yes, corruption is, is another area that uh, needs to be tackled. Okay, Thank let's you. get back. Let's get to Caliphate. Given your experience on the field, how would you advise Niger state government and the federal government on the need to address poor educational standard and increasing number of out of school children in the country? Okay, my first advice would be that um considering the situation of um, the um the primary school and the junior school um education system, I want I would just advise the government that they should work together with some of these NGOs because when I went to the field, I got to know that most of these things that are supposed to be done by the government, the NGOs are the ones doing them. Talking about building blocks of classrooms, and build, uh, water, building toilets, building um, so many things. These NGOs, they've been doing them. So, for instance, one primary school I went to an NGO built a block of classroom for them, but there are no chairs. You shouldn't expect an NGO that builds like blocks of classrooms for them. They should be the one to come and put chairs there for them too at the same time. So I feel the government needs to address issues affecting um, the primary school and the secondary school sector in the states. They need to like they need to consider like they need to prioritize their like their efforts that okay this is what we'll be looking at at this time just to make things work for these people because these um, uh, teachers they are just trying according to them they have been on salaries for months they've been deprived of their they've been deprived of their uh, let's say like their upgrade they've been deprived of their uh, promotion most of them are just stagnant they are not getting promoted, they are not getting increment in pay, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So these are issues. They need to motivate them to work more because it doesn't speak well when a teacher is being owned like 32 months uh, salaries. You, so she, she can't be productive. Okay. Um, so I feel the government just needs to come in and address issues that this report pointed out. Okay, we have a message via WhatsApp from Samson, and it says, Good morning to you. Great job you are doing. God bless you all. Thank you, and God bless you too. But we all have a responsibility to ensure that our children, which we say are the future of tomorrow, they are well taken care of. Because some of these children would compete with children from um, other parents, talking about the elites. Mm -hmm. If they are disadvantaged at this level, in the next 15, 20 years, they will still be at a disadvantage in terms of recruitment. When you go for interview, you are not able to meet up. What happens? You won't get the job. So the inequality continues to grow and the gap continues to widen. What would be your advice to government? Honestly, for me, the book lies on the table of government. Because what 
NGOs can do is just to advise, give technical advice based on their expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the government that has the funds to build schools. Because I remember in my state, uh, Kaduna State, when our governor then, about, uh, about seven years ago, when he came on board, we know what he did in education. That's why when you see education traveling in a particular state, it shows you that the governor has prioritized education. I know in my state, he built schools, like schools were selected across local governments. And those schools were, were refurbished. They were, they were, they were, uh, they were refurbished. They were furnished with chairs. You know, it, hap it happens that even my village, my village, like, like benefited. And I know when he even went to the quality of teachers, he had an uh, assessment for teachers. And there's a particular score. Once you don't get that score, you were dropped. A lot of people lost their jobs at the primary level. Many teachers lost their jobs. So it just shows you this is a governor that is intentional about education. Because the quality of education is very, very important. You rightly said about uh, the children in the rural areas have no hope. In fact, they don't, they don't, there's no, they, they don't have opportunities. Because we go to school just for us to take advantage of opportunities. But these children have no hope. They cannot even take advantage of opportunities because they are not well trained. You know, the quality of education was, is very, very low. So how can they take advantage of opportunities compared to children from the urban areas, you know. So the book likes on the table of the government because it's a government that has the money, that has the funding, you know, that has the funding. Even what donors can do is just maybe a particular percentage, maybe let's say about maybe 10%. But the government has, the book lies on the table of the government in terms of budgeting and in terms of uh, taking, I mean, uh, collaborating with key stakeholders uh, to, to ensure that the education sector is, is well, uh, provides an enabling environment for children to learn. You know, so government has to. I keep hoping that the role of government cannot be overemphasized. The role of the yes, government yes. cannot be overemphasized. Yeah. Um, we really must go because of our time, Esther. Please visit our news website, primognews.org. That is primognews.org for all the details of our reports and interviews. Visit our website, www.primog.org, to get all the information about Primog. And you can watch our videos on Prime Up TV, our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to get reminders when we have a new post. We sincerely appreciate our guests, Chief Executive Officer, Gender Consult, Troy Samadu, Investigative Journalist, Kafila Taiwo, and a board member of the Civil Society Action Coalition on Education for All, Abdullahi Sali, who joined us via the phone. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank for you. Okay, let me quickly mention that the UBEC Act 2004 speaks to compulsory and universal basic education for every child of primary and junior secondary school age. But unfortunately, from the reports before us, some of these children do not have that opportunity to get the basic education they need. Public Conscience has the support of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation committed to building a more just, verdant and peaceful world. Get more information about the foundation on its website, macfound.org. Join us again here next week for another episode of Public Conscience and remember to follow us on Facebook, X formerly known as Twitter, as Official Prime Org. I am Esther Bassi. Remember that birth registration and certificates are free if your child is under 18. Help stop the corruption in birth registration and do not pay for birth certificates. Also remember that you can give us information or hints about corrupt acts through our phone at 0902 Two six five six one six seven or info at primorg dot org. I am at Dalby or Thank you for listening. Let's do this again same time next week. Mm -hmm.